join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hi, my name is Krishnan. Today I'll be doing the Hindu news analysis. These are the five articles that we are going to discuss today. And uh, we'll be discussing uh, previous year prelims questions. Since prelims is around the corner, we'll be doing this as well. So let us go into the first topic. So what has happened? The Supreme Court has said, so far what will happen is, the Prime Minister will uh, advise the President and the President will just appoint the Chief Election Commissioner. But what the Supreme Court has done, it has said, no, no, year after, only the executive will not be responsible for appointing the chief election commissioner. Others, are, others also will be involved in the process. So we'll see what it has done. So this uh, apex court, that is the Supreme Court, has taken over the power of the executive as the sole authority to appoint the members of the election commission of India. So what it will do, it will give a boost to the independence of the election commission of India. So what are the three, what are the, who are the three members who will be part of this committee? Earlier only Prime Minister was there. Now the leader of opposition in the Lok Sabha is going to be there. And the Chief Justice of India is also going to be a part of this three member committee. So leader of opposition in the Lok Sabha or if they do not get the leader of opposition status, the leader of the single largest opposition party. So these three will be a part of the committee that is going to choose the Chief Election Commissioner. So what will happen, these three people will get together and they will decide this person is eligible to become the chief election commissioner and they'll also select the election commissioners also. So this is the format that is going to be followed from now on. So what happened earlier, chief election commissioner was appointed by the president on the advice of prime minister. But what constitutional bench said is original, original intent of the constitution makers was not that uh, you know the prime minister should, should simply appoint uh, election commissioner what they said is how the election commissioner should be appointed the manner of um, appointment should become up should be made into a parliamentary law and then through the law you follow the process so see if you read article 324 you will know president should appoint the cc and uh, commissioners subject to any law made in that behalf by the parliament so parliament should get together and make a law and through that law, you appoint the chief election commission and the other commissioners. But so far, 70 years since independence, no government has enacted the law. So the so the government, uh, so the Supreme Court said enough is enough. The intent of the constitution makers was that there should be a law, but you have not made a law. And only the prime minister is uh, appointing the uh, chief election commissioner. So what we are going to do, we are going to give this judgment. So hereafter, all these three people will be a part of the committee. So what is the significance of the judgment? Election commission, election commission will become more independent. He will not be beholden to the executive. That is, he will not fear the executive or he will look for favors from the executive. And no reciprocity or loyalty. So reciprocity means the prime minister will tell, I made you uh, election commissioner of India. So you do me some favor like that. So this cannot happen, right? Because the member of the... Uh, leader of the opposition party is also involved in this election process. So this part will not be there. And functional freedom. So these are the good things. But what now we are going to say is, can the presence of Chief Justice of India alone preserve the, in preserve the independence of the institution? No, it cannot. See, we, are, we have already seen what is happening with CBA, right? Even in CBA, Chief Justice or his nominee is part of the appointment committee. But what has happened to CBA? Supreme Court is calling CBA as a caged parrot, caged bird like that they are telling. So that is one flaw. Next, what they are telling, if, if there is CG, CJ presence, it might already give legit, legitimacy to all appointments. So if you are taking the case to the court telling, uh, you know, due procedures were not followed while appointing a particular person, what the court will tell already, Chief Justice was involved. So we will not get into the nuances. So uh, if the Chief Justice is involved, everything would have been done in a right manner only. So what, what will that will happen? It will lead to judicial Judicial scrutiny will not be there because CJ is already already involved, so we will not get into the, we will not scrutinize the appointment process like that they'll say. So what is the way forward? You take all these things into concern and you create a law based on what the Supreme Court has told. You don't go, go back to the whole system, you create a law on what the Supreme Court has told. So this is what they are trying to tell. Now let us move on to the next topic. 
this topic is about uh, g20 so you all know uh, india is going to host the g20 summit this year and there are different uh, ministerial meetings happening in different parts of the country and the thing is there is no consensus that is countries are na- not able to arrive at a unilateral decision unanimously they are not able to decide on a few issues so let us see what are those issues and what is happening and what india's host is trying to do so why is it in news because no consensus in g20 ministerial meetings over russian action in ukraine so this is the main problem okay so russia has invaded uh, ukraine and the innocent people civilians are dying and uh, different countries have different opinions over it like not a lot of countries are uh, condemning what russia is doing see in fact india has not condemned russian action in ukraine right so so there are a problem as to what uh, g20 countries should do with respect to russia and ukraine so two key ministerial meetings happened so one in bangalore and one in delhi uh, finance ministers and central bank governors where all the finance ministers of the g20 countries will come and meet and foreign ministers meeting all the foreign ministers of the g20 countries will come and uh, meet so here there was no consensus on this uh, russian action in ukraine so so what the editorial is telling is so since there is no consensus all the diplomats and g20 officials you sit back and decide what should be the way forward like you cannot keep arguing uh, you cannot keep telling things are not work- working out so you uh, pass and you do a stock taking exercise you see what is happening around the world and then uh, you come and meet and then uh, for the future course of action you take a stand like the territorialist are going so what is this uh, finance ministers and central bank uh, governors uh, ministerial meeting it is the 20 most developed countries uh, finance ministers and central bank governors of 20 most developed countries they will come together and discuss how the how the economy is there for these 20 countries so when was this when was this set up it was set up in 1999 to help global economic coordination what happened after the asian financial crisis so in 1998 east asian countries uh, had a huge financial crisis and uh, to avoid any future uh, crisis in 1919 this finance track was set up so uh, so you keep this in mind finance track it's called the finance track so why was it set up it was, it was set up because of the 1999 east asian financial crisis and what is the other one other one is the foreign ministers meeting so foreign ministers will come what is sherpa track sherpa sherpas means people who will help you climb the himalayas they are called sherpas so what uh, these sherpas will do uh, these are diplomats who will set the agenda so these these things we are going to discuss and in these things we have to arrive at consensus so these people set the agenda and they work on it so they are called sherpas so so what are the issues in uh, g20 ministerial meeting so there is huge russia west divide so what india should have done it should have learned from indonesian experience so last year indonesia in bali uh, the meeting was hosted and same problem was there so what happened russia and china refused to accept the language on ukrainian war so they had talked about ukrainian war and the words that they had mentioned in the g20 meetings uh, official record russia and china refused to accept because this this is very weird because three months back only in indonesia they accepted you can go ahead with this wording but now they are telling we will not accept this wording you need to change it so what happened uh, a joint communique could not be issued that is all country uh, leaders could not come together and give a joint statement instead what happened finance minister uh she just issued a chair summary an output of output document as to whatever uh, was discussed she gave an output and she just gave a chairman summary but what happened is the government included paragraph that russia and china ob- objected to so here uh, indian government has taken a uh, new stand because last year indonesia did not take the stand when russia and china objected to certain words and paragraph uh, in indonesia the indonesian government took it off but india has not done that so in uh, retrospect what we are uh, trying to tell is this is a very rocky start to g20 i mean it is not smooth like uh, on one camp uh, western countries are uh, one thing something on the other end china and russia they want something else so it's a rocky start to g20 but what finance minister jay shankar is telling is issues pertaining to global south such as food energy security debt management all these important things have been solved uh, there is consensus on these things 
and uh, whatever uh, work we are going to do on these areas we have consensus all 20 countries have a single notion on these uh, issues so what is the way forward so they are telling cannot bank on the bali language because now russia and china they are uh, uh, going against what they accepted in bali right in bali they accepted to uh, whatever uh, uh, wordings that were used on uh, russian invasion of ukraine but now they are uh, backtracking on it so they are telling don't bank on the bali bali uh, summit you develop a new consensus on ukrainian issue so they are telling india should develop a new consensus on ukrainian issue and you need to balance between russian grievances on the language that is whatever wordings that is used there are certain russian grievances we need to balance that and the western desire to retain its success in condemning russian actions so uh, what did west think in in bali they thought they were successful because certain words that they wanted in the document they had it so they thought they were successful in condemning russia's action so what india india is supposed to should do is we need to balance between we need to balance russian grievances and west grievances so that we should do so and what we are what we are supposed to do is we should also go beyond the issues of g7 countries so this is this is what we as host should do because uh, uh, we cannot just keep seeing g7 issues right there are other 13 countries we should look into their issues also so this is what this editorial is saying that india should find a middle path and it should go beyond g7 issues so this is what uh, this article is about let us move on to the next topic. This topic is about how clean technology is transforming rural India. So what is clean technology? Technologies that do not uh, harm the environment, that do not pollute, that use renewable energy, technologies that are sustainable in the long run, they are all clean technology. So I'll give you a few examples. In rural, in rural India where these clean technologies are being used, they are used uh, from solar refrigerators, uh, silk reeling machines, biomass based coal storage, uh, milk chillers in these areas these clean technologies are being used so we'll see how it is transforming lives in rural india so so uh, a recent study from council on energy environment and water what they are telling close to 13000 people adapted clean tech livelihood appliances in that 80 percent are women so a lot of people are coming forward to uh, adopt clean technology uh, in that overwhelmingly women are interested so what uh, these the products or these devices are called they are called distributed renewable energy products so what they are doing they are transforming women's livelihoods at the grassroots level at the rural level they are going and transforming uh, women's lives so what they are doing they are enhancing women's uh, income opportunities through mechanization so why mechanization helps because otherwise women have to do all those works with their own hands so in rural areas not even not just rural areas even in urban areas you have several gender assigned manual activities that are very very difficult only women must do men will not do that work there are a lot of works like that right in rural and urban areas so what these devices are doing these products are doing in rural areas is they are uh, freeing women from the very difficult uh, manual labor so in that way they are helping and what are the other ways in India, it is expected in few years, 30 million women-owned MSMEs are going to be there. And uh, these 30 million women-owned MSMEs will employ around 150 million people. So what is going to happen? Soon, India is going to have a $50 billion market opportunity. In India alone, this is going to happen and 30 million women are going to own MSMEs. So what we must think right now is how we are going to maximize this distributed renewable energy how we are going to help women how we are going to save nature all this we have to think so here the authors have given us five steps let us analyze those five steps <coughs> excuse so what they are telling firstly you leverage the experience of other women so there are other women right uh, they might have adopted these technologies before itself so first what women might think oh no see these devices or these products are very expensive uh, we cannot uh, buy all those things so first what we should do we should uh, bring in women who have already used these uh, products and if we show them as uh, demo champions or sales agents they can tell other women and these women will buy the products so that is one thing what is the second thing they are telling organize hyper local events and demos so you, you go to the smallest of smallest village and there and there you go and show all these products to the women there so what will happen if if women touch 
and uh, see this high technology if they are able to see it uh, from close quarters if they are able to touch it then they will buy it so so they are telling you should organize hyper local events and what will happen if demos happen in local areas women will be able to network and get in touch with people who can help them buy this product they can get in touch with uh, financiers so they are telling if you go to local areas there will be a lot of uh, socializing that is happening and women will be able to network with so that is the second thing third what they are telling you give easy finance so uh, so what will happen women women will not have enough money right so uh, financiers and other people they should give uh, uh, easy finance that is even if they even if they default uh, they should give some support mechanism like that so this is already happening in andhra pradesh uh, this uh, uh, finance group called samunati finance what they are doing 80% first loan default guarantee uh they have given for a women led uh, farmer producer organization so they're telling we should have easy finance like this and what they are telling next they are telling after sale service also you give after sale services means if there is any problem after you sell the product you give after after sale services and buy back if there are any problem you buy it back so those things are also they are telling the product owner should give them <coughs> next what they are telling evidence on the economic viability of these technology should be shared so this this you understand right so they are telling these are not just expensive if you use it you can get lot of uh, profit out of it that you should go and tell the uh, women micro entrepreneurs next what they are telling support backward and forward market linkage so what is happening already there is established market right there are already uh, uh, established players so women will find it difficult to penetrate through this uh, market chains and generally women will not have contacts networks outside their villages so what they are telling here you try to uh, help women with forward and backward market linkage so if if we help them women will be able to dominate the market so this is what this is what they are telling uh, you help them with backward and forward market linkage because uh, women have limited mobility they they are not allowed by their husbands to go out of the villages so they are telling in these areas you help women next what they are telling facilitate policy convergence so whatever you do the impact of private sector will be less only so government only, only if government comes in the impact will be huge because the scaling capability of government is high so first what they are telling policy convergence Pol government should uh, bring this as a policy itself so that they are telling and they are telling multiple ministries are involved here uh, you know right horticulture agriculture uh, ministry of msmes ministry of textiles they are all doing programs where women are involved so they are telling there should be convergence in these areas and what they are telling in whatever programs they have they should embrace clean energy solutions so at one end you are embracing clean energy solutions at the other end you are helping women also so we need convergence of these things so finally what they are telling we need coming together of policy makers investors financiers technology promoters and ecosystem enablers if all these people come together there will be synergy between rural women and clean energy ambitions so at one end women also will become entrepreneurs and they will be also be using clean technology also so this is what uh, this article is about let us move on to the next topic this topic is about uh, quad members uh, taking a stand and uh, russia and china going against it so uh, so let us see let us see what stand they took and what was the reaction of uh, russia and china so india and other quad members so what they did they condemned russian action in ukraine so that so they so they told russia's uh, uh, invasion of uh, ukraine is wrong because innocent civilians are dying and what they said they need a uh, that they asked for rules based order in south and east china sea so why they are telling this they are telling this because uh, uh, china is uh, claiming a lot of uh, territory in these regions as their own and uh, experts are also anticipating a chinese invasion of taiwan so these things are going on so quad members are uh, taking a stand against these two issues so responding to this uh, what did uh, russia say they called quad group as exclusionary and disruptive what is exclusionary they are telling it is just four four countries they are together uh, they are excluding other countries and they are disruptive disruptive means uh, they are unnecessarily they are causing problems like that they are telling 
so in sixth quad meeting what did uh, quad members tell they are telling conflict in ukraine is causing immense human suffering so like this they are, they have told and they are telling even though there is conflict no party should use nuclear weapon nuclear weapon is uh, inadmissible nobody should use nuclear weapon and we need lasting peace in ukraine so since quad members have told all these things it has hurt russia so they are telling russia russia is telling quad is it's just an uh, exclusionary group it is disruptive like that they are trying to dismiss quad members so next what they are telling they are telling we need to respect sovereignty and territorial integrity of other countries and there should be transparent and peaceful resolution of disputes this they are telling to china so with respect to taiwan next what they are telling they are telling we need uh, whatever we do we need asian collaboration like that they are telling and we need uh, status quo in indo pacific relation so first they are telling we need asian collaboration with the quad and we need status quo in indo pacific region so they are telling all this with respect to tensions in taiwan so uh, indo pacific region was mentioned and uh, asean uh, collaboration was uh, asked for because they are telling uh, any time they feel china might uh, invade taiwan so we need to be uh, cautious of these things and next what they did they expressed concerns over militarization of militarization of disputed features so if there is any dispute uh, immediately we are uh, militarizing it so they are telling this is wrong and uh, there is dangerous use of coast guard vessels in this indo pacific uh, region and uh, maritime militia we are using so uh, so what is this maritime militia they are they are uh, shooting other countries vessels so they are telling these are all very wrong things we are expressing concern over these things and next what they are telling there are efforts to disrupt other countries offshore offshore uh, resource exploitation activity so let's say if in if in one place a country can exploit this resources other countries are coming and claiming it so this is a veiled attack on china only so they are telling these are all these things are wrong so next what they are telling quad maritime security working group we will meet soon and we'll discuss on we'll discuss about this maritime issues so again what russia is telling see uh, this quad is a very wrong thing because they are playing one country against the other and mention of asean is uh, intent why they, why have they mentioned asean because the intention is to cut off russia and china from east asian summits they are they are telling they are trying to alienate russia and china from each east asian countries but what uh, india is telling quad not for uh, i mean uh, what is russia telling no no see quad members are telling uh, quad is for economical purpose only but don't believe it quad is not for economical purpose but for military purpose like that russia is telling but what are uh, foreign minister uh, jay shankar said he is telling we are using quad only for un reforms expansion of un security council and condemnation of terrorism so 2611 patan code all these things happened in uh, india right so there so f- f- uh, foreign minister saying we are using quad only for these things and what is china is, china is telling china is telling quad is just a c form is telling a c form means it will sometimes it will be there sometimes it will not be there so we need not have to take quad seriously like the china is trying to dismiss quad as a very small organization and it's telling it's just small circles led by the us so this is what uh, russia and china feel about quad but what quad has done it has taken a very significant step of condemning ukraine's action and china's action so this is what this article is about let us move on to the next topic this topic is about uh, old pension scheme so what has happened is uh, the government has uh, decided to give one time option to certain uh, few select central government employees to migrate to old pension scheme so what has happened uh, there is old pension scheme and new pension uh, that is national pension system right so the o- ops is the old one and the nps is the new one so what happened uh, so if the employee had applied for jobs before december 22 2003 uh, that is the day before the national pension system was notified he is eligible to switch back to the old pension system so he should have joined service in 2004 so that is when the nps came into effect right so so the option is available to all the central government uh, employees enrolled under the nps as a joint service on, on or after january 2004 so this is uh, this is the thing so 2003 2004 people who joined around uh, uh, this uh, date they will be eligible to go back to ops that is old pension uh, scheme so this is also available to cpf personnel 
and uh, so what will happen so the employees contribution to the nps will be credited to the provident fund account of the individual so uh, i'll tell you how this uh, this pension scheme works so now let's see uh, what is the difference between old pension scheme and uh, uh, new pension scheme so so first of all what happened is uh, this whole system the government is telling it is unnecessary bur- burden on the government expenditure so this is costing the government a lot so we'll have to do away with the old system and we'll have to come come with a new system but uh, states such as uh, chatisgarh rajasthan jharkhand himachal pradesh they already told they'll be going back to the old pension system so what has happened till january 31st a total of 2365693 central employees and in state government 6032068 employees have enrolled under the national uh, pension system except west bengal all states have implemented the national pension scheme so uh, so what is the difference between the old and new pension scheme so in the old scheme lifelong in income post retirement but what will happen is government will bear the expenditure incurred on the pension so uh, whatever uh, money whatever pension the government is giving it is from the government itself so what will happen under this uh, scheme and under this uh, scheme uh, a monthly payment is assured by the amount is equal to 50% of the last drawn salary that is if your last drawn salary is 2 lakh what the government will do 50% 1 lakh every month it will give under the uh, old pension scheme if you 50000 it will give 25000 you don't have to contribute anything so this is a old pension scheme but what is the national pension scheme that is the new one it is a participatory participatory scheme uh, where employees contribute a part of their salaries to the pension uh, corpus and government will give a matching contribution so what will happen the funds are invested in investment schemes through pension fund managers so there's a corpus in this corpus you will have to give a part of your salary and government will match the amount and it will be invested somewhere and pension fund managers will manage it so what will happen on retirement 60% of the corpus this is tax free so you can take it 60% you can take it as bulk amount and it will not be tax and the remaining 40% it will be invested in annuities that is in annuity means every month you will get a part Uh, part of this uh, amount which this will be taxed so 60% you can take it as bulk amount 40% will be given as annuities and that will be taxed so this is the national pension scheme this is the new one so this is the difference between the old and the new one and what we saw earlier this uh, contribution to the nps will be through the provident fund so this is also you should know so this is what uh, this article is about uh, so and uh, you should know about the national pension scheme so when was this launched this was launched in january 2004 it is extended to all citizens corporates and nris and who will do this pfrd will do this it will regulate promote and ensure the orderly growth of national pension scheme so subscribers will contribute regularly in their pension account and on retirement can withdraw part of the corpus what is the part of the corpus that can be withdrawn 60% and remaining corpus to buy an annuity to secure regular income after uh, retirement that is 40% so this is what national pension scheme is let us move on to the previous year uh, question section so what we'll do here is we'll we'll discuss four questions from previous years so let us go on to the first question In the first lok sabha the single largest party in the opposition was the swatantra party so is this right no this is not right the first uh, sing- the single largest party in the opposition was communist party of india it, it was cpa so the first statement is wrong so since the first statement is wrong a and d are gone so in in the lok sabha leader of the opposition was f- recognized for the first time in 1969 yes this is right in the lok sabha if a party does not have a minimum of 75 members its leader cannot be recognized as the leader of opposition no this is wrong this is not 75 members it is 1/10 of the uh, strength of the house so this is wrong so if third is wrong 1 2 that is c d and a all will go so the answer is option b 2 only so this is a very easy question from uh, science so which of the following leaf modification occurs in the des- desert area to inhibit water loss hard and waxy leaves tiny leaves 
thorns instead of leaves so all three are correct so option d is the right answer so let us go on to the next question the parliament of india can place a particular law in ninth schedule of the constitution of india yes this they can do the validity of a law placed in the ninth schedule cannot be examined by any court and no judgment can be made on it this is wrong because after the keshavananda bharati case uh, which happened in april 24 1973 when the supreme court propounded the basic structure doc doctrine so till that date uh, judicial review will on ninth schedule but after that judicial review is possible on ninth schedule so second option is uh, wrong so option a one only is the right answer so which which one of the following best describes the term merchant discount rate so this was in the current affairs uh, when demonetization was uh, going on so so merchant discount rate means uh, only if you know the right answer you can i mean you cannot eliminate or uh, uh, you cannot make edu- educated guesses so you will have to you should have studied this so the right answer is the charge to a merchant by a bank for accepting payment from his customers through the bank's debit card so this is merchant discount rate the name is a bit misleading because this is the amount that a merchant gives to the bank so this this you should have studied so there was uh, there is no other way to guess or eliminate options so so this is what uh, it is about today uh, if you if you like the content you can uh, like it uh share on subscribe the channel you can follow us on youtube you can also follow us on instagram uh telegram and facebook thanks for tuning in we'll see you again bye